The Northern New Jersey Traumatic Brain Injury Model System proudly presents Moving Forward, Personal Perspectives on Life After Brain Injury, a virtual speaker series for individuals with brain injury, family members, and friends, sponsored by Kessler Foundation and Kessler Institute for Rehabilitation. ...of the Traumatic Brain Injury Virtual Speaker Series. This series is sponsored by the Kessler Foundation as part of our TBI model system grant, which is funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. It's now my pleasure to introduce Alder Crocker. In 2018, Alder Crocker sustained a spinal cord injury and a traumatic brain injury from a freak accident that occurred as he was jogging into the ocean while on vacation in Mexico. Although he has range of motion in his shoulders and arms, he has no movement in his fingers. To help improve muscle memory, Alder participated in four art therapy sessions while a patient at Kessler Institute for Rehabilitation. In his own words, and the darndest thing happened, as soon as I had a brush in my hand, images and colors began to flood my consciousness and quite miraculously, I was able to paint, the beneficiary of acquired savant syndrome. The traumatic brain injury had somehow uncovered latent artistic ability. It is our great pleasure to welcome Alder Crocker, or as he refers to himself, the accidental painter. We're gonna first start with a video before his presentation.
Uh, my name is Alder Crocker. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, well, you know, I don't really watch that video a lot, um, but boy, it brings back a flood of memories. And the one thing that I take out of it is the two things actually are that I'm really very, very fortunate that I had Kessler on my side. There were a lot of opportunities um, to choose different um, rehab facilities, but a lot of my friends, I live on the East Coast in Connecticut. A lot of my friends knew about Kessler and it was really the only choice for me. And I was very fortunate that they had a spot and uh, ultimately it ended up completely changing my life. And the second is that I'm really fortunate I had a lot of friends to, uh, to help me along the way. And that's kind of really what's gotten me here today. Um, but I think if it's okay, while that video was pretty comprehensive, I'll sort of walk you through it a little bit more. And, and basically what, what happened was, was very simple. Um, I'm just gonna push this back for a second, was that I'm on vacation, second day in Mexico, I hadn't had a vacation in about two years. And I uh, was with my wife and about eight friends, it was a group thing. And uh, we'd just gone ATVing in the morning, it was terrific. Just had had lunch and it was sort of towards the end, middle end of the day. And it was, uh, you know, let's go in for a last swim. And I thought, okay, what the heck? I was a big ocean swimmer my entire life. The bigger uh, waves, the better. One of those knuckleheads that used to carry fins in my trunk and sort of chase after, you know, bad weather. And um, flat calm day, of course. And so I'm you know, more like, let's go in. And so I thought, okay, do the old man's jog. I'm 58 right now. I was just about to turn 55 then. Do the old man's jog in. And I'm in about, I don't know, six, eight inches of water. And the sand gave way a little bit underneath my left foot. And I sort of came off balance. And then my knee gave way. And, you know, it's sort of when you bend and tuck, you do a little somersault. Well, I did that and I whipped around, but I was too far close down to the ground. And my head hit the sand. And immediately I snapped my neck like a twig, just like that. And immediately I was 85% paralyzed. As um, uh, they said, uh, Jeannie said, I can move my shoulders and my arms, but I have no use of my fingers, uh, but I can move my wrists. But I knew immediately that I was paralyzed. Um, and it was crazy, it literally happened in one second. I'm just jogging, I tripped and bam, and I hit my head and I hit it severely hard. And I had a huge crown on it for about three months or so. Um, and so immediately I was paralyzed. Uh, I was fortunate, if you can call it that. Uh, my brother-in-law had a similar accident five years before that on Long Island. He was swimming in three uh, feet of water. I was next to him and he went down and he hit a little berm, hit his head, broke his neck also, but he was incomplete. He's walking today, thank goodness. But what he didn't do was he didn't close his mouth and he swallowed a whole lot of seawater. And so, I was fortunate that at the presence of mind that I was able to move my arms just a little bit and I popped up over the water and held it and then put my face down in the water and hoped that somebody would come get me and it happened about 15 or 20 plus seconds later my wife and a friend came back and saw me didn't realize why I was floating in a foot of water by then and uh, they got me and they turned me over and immediately I had said to my wife, I said, oh my God, I'm paralyzed. I can't move anything. I'm just like Anthony, my brother-in-law. And then um, they moved me up onto the beach. An interesting happened, though, thing happened though, which I really haven't told anybody until I was just thinking about today's presentation, was that when I hit my head, I did see lights, if you will. What I saw was, uh, it, in essence, it was a black and white, um, uh, x-ray of my spine and my skull it was coming down, except it wasn't black and white. My spine and my head were green like a circuit board. Very strange. And what I saw were exploding lights, orange and red and yellow and white and like a light blue. And it was it just obviously for an instant, a fraction of a second, but I see it every day, actually, when I wake up. It's just one of those things that I'll remember for the rest of my life. But I knew immediately. So it was, I knew right off then that something you know, we've all knocked our heads every now and then, but this was obviously completely different. I ended up, um, thank goodness my wife, she sort of, what, what I say, CEO'd the heck out of it and told all of our friends, call American Express, you know, whatever, because, you know, they help everybody, uh, call the hotel, call these people, call the nurse, people that we know in the States, help get them out. And 12 hours later, thank goodness I was um, airlifted. My wife essentially stole a, um, a Learjet or a Medjet, if you will. Um, but what had happened was that as soon as that, um, that I was on the ground and they had turned me over, um, 
the first thing I started, I said to myself was be strong. So as you saw in that video, um, there were t-shirts that said be strong and a few other things. That's what I chanted for the first 20 minutes. And that's all I kept doing was be strong for myself, be strong for my family. And then I, then I passed out and I was uh, pretty much in a coma for, I'm going to say a day and a half, almost two days. They flew me to uh, UCLA, to the ICU, um, put tubes in me. They uh, operated on me. In fact, at first they said, there's nothing we can do. We're just going to give him an hour's operation. He's more severe than we had thought. And then some other doctor walked in the room, honestly, and said, wait, I think I can do something else. And they ended up putting rods in my neck and screws and all that and straightening it and tightening it a little bit more so that I wouldn't, you know, that I would actually have movement of, uh, of my neck in a way that I wouldn't without that. So very, very fortunate. Uh, I ended up spending three weeks in the ICU, but, you know, I'll get into the painting aspect if that's okay and sort of how I got there um, and, and how Kessler was, you know, instrumental in me where I am today, as you can see some of the paintings behind me. When I was in the ICU and I woke up, they didn't know how to communicate with me. I had tubes down my throat, tubes in my nose, tubes everywhere. I was a pin cushion. And so we had a conversation board and it's about two feet by three feet and it had stick figures and, and letters and words and all that. And I used that for two days to communicate with my wife and the nurses and the doctors and the surgeons and all that. And that was traumatic in and of itself because I never thought I would speak again. I had no idea what was going on. And what I kept saying was, be strong, be strong, you're gonna get out of this. And slowly but surely, thank goodness, with everybody talking to me and I could hear, I just couldn't speak. It was very strange. I, I, I thought that I you know, had a traumatic brain injury that I would not be able to get out of until, you know, to where I am today. And um, I was very fortunate that little by little, everything started to get back into shape. And then they took the tubes out and I was able to speak, which was great. And then the next thing they did was immediately put me into exercise. And so, you know, I was having black dreams, really dark dreams. It was a very difficult thing to happen at, at the very beginning. I didn't know what was going on. People couldn't really tell me, well, you're going to get over the black dreams. But I knew that ultimately I would. But it was very, you know, you have to plod yourself one step at a time. And everything that they did for me was, was exercise, moving my arms, trying to get some, you know, muscle movement back, um, sitting me up and everything. Um, but also eating when I was able or, or drinking, actually, I wasn't able to eat for about six weeks. Um, but I had, a, um, I had to do a lot of breathing exercises, as you can well imagine. And so they were essentially testing me, you know, every two hours and every four hours with some different type of a protocol. And the way that I approached it was as if everything was a challenge. And for some reason, when I came out of when I basically awoke, I thought, oh, my God, I didn't die. And I could not have been happier with the fact that I was alive. And I thought, no matter what state I'm in, I'm alive and I will figure it out. And I have friends and family around. And the next thing it was, okay, it's a challenge. And everything I did moving forward was, okay, now I have to move the spoon to my mouth. And if I spilled something, I didn't win that challenge. And I'm sure like, just like you, I kind of like to win at everything. I don't like to lose. So it was, you know, do that again and do that again. And if I, I couldn't move a certain way or I couldn't turn on my side uh, because at the ICU, they have what they call a lift team. And they're two giant bouncer looking guys, very nice guys, different sets of teams. And every two hours they would come to your, to your, your room and they would tilt you on your side or on your other side and they'd wedge you and, and they weren't very good at making you comfortable but they were good at turning you over. So you kind of had to figure out, all right, well, how do I make myself comfortable? How do I make myself, you know, um, able to overcome this challenge? How do I make myself breathe into that, you know, that blue and white um, uh, clear plastic tube where the ball goes up and down? How do I make that work? And so it was always about a challenge. And so honestly, until through until today, this day and moving forward, everything that I do is I consider a challenge. So if I can win it, it's great. By being able to pick up. A, a juice bottle, if you will, and not dropping it because I don't have use of my fingers. Um, not dropping it is a win. So um, I mentioned that just because that's kind of what kept me going and everything that I did, as well as the painting. 
So I spent three weeks in ICU. And then finally, uh, I was able to be admitted uh, to Kessler. And I got there. And the first thing that they did was put me in an electric wheelchair. And that was a fright into itself. I had no idea about it. And so I started to learn how to do that and had exercises every morning. And it was a pretty interesting approach because you're we weighing everything possible on your mind. Can I work again? Will I walk again? Will I have proper mental faculties again? Will I be able to use my hands? Everything that is flying around. And yet what Kessler is teaching you or they were teaching me at that is let's get your muscle movement together. Let's get your muscle movement back. And then in the afternoon, let's you know, work on occupational and see how you interact with, you know, your basic surrounding, which was terrific. The process for me was terrific. And then after that, say three o'clock on would be where the, um, the, the therapist, um, uh, you know, the shrinks, if you will, but the therapist would come and they would talk to us or me and, you know, try to uh, uh, figure out where I was, you know, headspace wise. Make a long story short, and I apologize for, for droning on at this point. I spent every afternoon for the next two months uh, until actually the, the, the painting therapy. Um, and my shrink, the, the therapist said, you really shouldn't do that, Alder. And I said, this is the only way I'm gonna be able to figure out where I am. But every afternoon I took my wheelchair after I sort of did a little Mario Andretti, you know, um, uh, Indianapolis 500 sort of cruise around the place as fast as I could, you know, with people telling me to slow down. Um, and yes, I am was 55 then. Um, uh, what I did was, was I'd go outside and I would sit outside and I'd get in my chair and I'd rock and I'd go back. And what I would say for two hours every day were all the things that I would never do again. I'm never going to walk again. I'm never going to dance with my uh, wife again. I'm never going to cook again. I'm never going to run up steps. Man, I didn't really like steps anyway, so that's fine with me. Um, I'm never going to swim again. I will swim again. I will get in the pool and I will swim again. And so I did this literally howling at the wolves for two months, nonstop for me. And it was the most cathartic thing for me personally, because I needed to see where the bottom was before I could understand where there could even be a top, right? I had no idea what the opportunities were in front of me. All I knew is that I was trying to move things and trying to do things every day, but I didn't know where my head was at. And I knew that that was the most important. If I had my head on straight, then the rest will follow suit for me personally. What I also did during this is I had two tremendous um, physical therapists and occupational therapists, Isa and um, Kira, and they put me through the regimen and they worked me very hard, but not but, and what I did to make sure that I maintained the challenge approach was every time I did something, I needed to do two more. So my rally cry for myself was two more. Every single thing I did, two more. So if I was trying to figure out an occupational, how to use my fork and, and, it, and it wouldn't work and the peas would fall off, I wouldn't get upset. I'd say, all right, two more. And I'd work on it until I actually did it two more times or I did it successfully two more times. And for me, it was till it was successfully two more times and they would kick me out and they'd say, we're done with you. You know, your hour and a half is up. And I'd be like, I'm not ready to go yet because I had to do that. It wasn't a compulsion then, which the painting became for me. It was, uh, this is the rest of my life. And this is the only point in my life where I have an opportunity that I knew right then to push it as hard as I could. Of course, we all know now that as soon as you get home, once you learn how to push it, you can push it as hard as you possibly can, which I try to do every day as well. So everything I did was two more, two more. And I thought, okay, this is great. And I'm working it and I'm, and I'm making things happen and stretching as much as I possibly can. And I'm moving things and they're not going to places I want them to. And, and I was getting frustrated. And, and I'm fortunate that I'm generally a happy kind of guy. I'm, 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 the glass is always half full. That's just where, where I'm fortunate. I totally understand the half empty. Um, and I realize that there are ways and I know ways for myself to get out of the half empty. But about four weeks or so in, I, um, I was having a couple of tough days as we all do. And I went to one of the therapists and I said, okay, I don't want any, any shrinking. I don't, I don't do that. I don't want the, well, you know, you need to, no, no, I don't, I just, I'm past that. I'm old enough. You know, I've got enough going on where I'm thinking about what it is that, I, that I'm doing every day. 
I think I'm on the right path, but I'm missing something. I, 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 I need more. And I know you've got something in your back pocket. And so I need that. And she looked at me, she's like, I don't have anything in my back pocket. And I said, dig deep because I know you do. What do you tell people when they hit the wall? You know, that, that they, they, they don't know necessarily where to go next and, and that they're frustrated, but you know, they can see that there's something in the future, but they can't get there. And she said to me two words that I use to this day. I probably told no less than 50 people as well. And they're two very simple words and they get me out of every single situation. And when I mean every single situation, for me personally, every single one. The two words are very simple. They are for now, for now, F-O-R-N-O-W, for now. And what that means to me is that, and the way that she presented it to me was, no matter what you're going through right now, it's for now. In a half an hour, in 10 minutes, in two hours tomorrow, that will change. Your circumstances will change. You won't be thinking about whatever it is that you're thinking about now, later on, because everything changes. Your moods change, the day change, the temperatures change, the light, the dark, the sun, the moon, whatever it is, it changes and so will you. Whatever you're going through, is just for now, cathartic moment in my life. And so I met, I, I utilized for now, be strong, two more and howling at the wolves to help me not become depressed like I saw other people doing. I was very fortunate that um, I made friends with a bunch of people and we chatted about this in group scenarios and what to do and how to sort of present ourselves when we were alone, but also you know with other people. It worked out very well for me and I was very fortunate. And it worked out honestly for the other people that were in our, you know, I guess there were four other people in the group haphazardly. Um, they obviously come and go. So I went through therapy. I was at uh, um, Kessler for 10 weeks. And so about two weeks after the for now, I'm just about to go outside. It's a beautiful day. It's the middle of July, <laughs> excuse me, end of July. And I'm thinking, all right, do I go six miles an hour today? And which loop do I do? And what kind of diamonds do I run around? And, you know, just trying to pretend like I'm in a go-kart because I'm trying to keep the drive alive and keep momentum going. And uh, the art therapist, Chris Byrne, who works at, at, um, at Kessler, came by, very chill dude, very nice guy, came by and said, hey, Older, what are you doing at three? And I said, I'm not doing art therapy. That's what I'm not doing. I'm going to go outside. And I'm going to do a bunch of other stuff. And he's like, great. Why don't you do a little art therapy? I said, I don't do art. The last time I did art was third grade when I, you know, sort of painted the fruit bowl. They called it compost. I stopped kind of really painting after that. I thought I'm not going to paint garbage and, you know, became the class clown at that moment. And that didn't go anywhere. So um, I never went back to painting and thought, thank you. Have a nice day. Chris was very persistent. He said, no, no, I really think that you should do this. It's great for muscle memory. You know, it's great for just sort of understanding yourself. Um, to in a, in a different way. And don't worry, I'm not going to shrink you. Well, little did I know that that's exactly what he wanted to do was to shrink me. And I say that because those were the terms that he and I used. He's like, I'm not, I'm like you are. And it was a lot of fun because we had some great conversations. But what he really was doing was trying to get me to not think about my disability, not think about being in a wheelchair, not thinking that, I mean, I have my ticky tack things on right now for how I use the computer, but I you know, my hands are not, they're not usable. That I, I can use tenodesis, as I'm sure some of you are familiar with, but after that, I can't move anything. So Chris said, come hang out with me. And I'm like, oh, okay, why not? I'll, I'll humor you. Um, you're younger than I am, so I'll humor you. What the heck? So he brought out, he's like, we're going to do watercolors today. And I said, the only thing I know about watercolors is that they're messy. And he said, don't worry, I'll take care of that. And so he put the piece of paper down, he taped it down. We started talking about where's your head at, what's going on. I'm like, Chris, I don't want to do that. Ooh, I like orange. So he put a brush in my hand. It was the strangest thing. He put the colors down in a little um, palette, water on it. He got the, 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 uh, the piece of paper out. And then he put the brush in my hand with a, um, I don't have one next to me, but with a, uh, like a, a rubber um, a tube around it so that I could grip it with both hands or just kind of it and then be able to move it. He literally put the brush in my hand and I put it in the paint and I started to put the orange down. And as it said in the video, and as Jeannie said before, all of a sudden, all of these colors started to fly out of my head. All of these ideas, these, these shapes and these colors and the, 
different way that things should go together. And I've been in marketing for 30 years. So I've been around creative, seen a lot of it, had a lot of art directors work for me. And, um, but I was stick figure guy at best. And they used to say, Alder, don't ever draw again. Yeah, I'm blind, you know, use your words. That's what they pay you for. Don't ever, you know, don't even pick up a pencil. So I just it came into my hand and it was, it was an amazing feeling. And I looked at, at Chris and he's, he looked at me like, what happened? I'm like, all right, I need a blue. So I got another paintbrush and I did a little bit of blue and then I, okay, I need a green. Okay, a green. Or I need a black. Well, all of a sudden I started painting and it really was the muscle memory. It just came as if I'd been painting before and I had no idea what was going on. A year and a half later, a friend of mine, uh, I was having an art show on my first one. And he said, I think you have this thing called uh, acquired savant syndrome. And at that point I said, I don't know what you're talking about, dude. I don't know who you are. And I don't know what that means. Have a nice day. He, thank goodness, was a little bit persistent also. And we ended up having lunch. And there's more than I'll tell you about that in a minute. <laughs> Excuse me. So I'm with Chris. And all of a sudden, I'm just painting. He's like, are you sure you've never painted before? And I said, I don't know what's going on. And he got another piece of paper. And then another piece of paper. And all of a sudden, I started just, just banging out um, um, these little teeny paintings. And then, of course, as I'm really getting into it, okay, our time is up, as it always is, right? Whenever you're having the best time, time's up. You're like, no, come back. So then all of a sudden, the paper I got out, I, you know, I took it out of my hand and 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 it, it almost was like a plug in and a plug out. And I still had ideas, but there wasn't the color rush, if you will. So I went outside, um, you know, started howling at the moon again, but started still seeing these colors. And it was really cool. And I had no idea what it was. Didn't even pay attention to it. A few days later, Chris and I go back. We start talking again and just about philosophy and life and kids and all that. And, and you know, give me this, give me that. Okay, no, I want this. No, no, over there. Okay, let's tilt it a little bit. I need more water. All right, I need some acrylic. And before you know it, it you know, it just, I kept on going. And, and you know, brains really are amazing, right? I mean, it's it's really fundamentally not unheard of obviously because it's been heard of but I had no idea whatsoever that my brain was able to process that and was able to all of a sudden channel you know the accident and the traumatic injury that I had and again it literally it uncovered the latent ability to uh, to paint there are a hundred to maybe 200 people in the world that have acquired savant syndrome the reason why they don't know is because if a friend hadn't told me, I wouldn't know. And I'd just be doing my thing in my studio. Um, but um, we're very fortunate, but most of them are in math and in music. And it's um, uh, on the autism spectrum. There was a doctor, there was a doctor, the, the, the gentleman died about eight months ago. His name was Dr. Darnold Treffert of the Treffert, um, uh, the Treffert Center up at Wisconsin and uh, one of the colleges up there. And he's one of the foremost authorities on autism. And the friend that I had met a year late, year and a half later told me about him, but he explained the whole thing to me and how it worked. And ultimately I was put on the registry uh, after taking a, a, a battery of tests. Um, pretty crazy. So fast forward, um, uh, I only had about four classes with Chris, but I was touched and I was ready to go. And so I got home, my family had got me an art um, a kit. The next thing I know, I'm buying canvases left and right and I'm painting stuff and I'm literally paint, 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 throw them away, paint, 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 throw it away, paint, paint, paint. And the part about the acquired savant syndrome where they recognize that you are actually within the parameters of the syndrome is um, compulsion. So you feel compelled to paint and I feel compelled to paint to this day. So I wake up, literally I wake up and I'm, I've got, 20 ideas in front of me that I've been thinking about or that I had when I was dreaming. Or I look across the room and I see the TV or I see my juice from the night before or I see whatever it is that I see and all of a sudden I, I see shapes and then all of a sudden designs start popping out. I probably have about three or 400 ideas a day that just I can't channel or stop. And it's not overwhelming. It's just like I'm looking at something right now. I'm looking at the corner of the uh, uh, of the computer and I can actually see several shapes in the corner up here and I'm thinking gee that's a great contrast maybe I'll use that for my next painting there's 
you know, right angles or white lines or this, oh, there are graphics, there's a blue up there. I'm just looking at the board or the zoom in front of me and it's literally given me about 10 ideas already. So it's crazy that way. So it's called acquired savant syndrome or sudden savant syndrome. And the savant is that all of a sudden that's your thing. And so I don't really type anymore. I used to head up strategy. I had my own advertising agency. And then I worked for another company and I did writing and I did creative. I did a lot of things creatively, but they're primarily strategic from a, an intellectual standpoint. I don't really do that anymore. I don't, I mean, I have the capacity, but I don't have the, the complete capacity. What I now have is the want and the need to actually do the creative myself, as opposed to think about how it will work in you know, 10 different ways from a strategic standpoint. So my brain changed. And it was because of the, you know, as I say to people, oh, the bunk I got on my head. Well, the bunk on my head was like a hammer to the head. It was that hard. And, um, and I'm very fortunate. So fast forward a little bit. I kept on painting about nine months or so later, give or take, yeah, you know, give or take a year or so later, a couple of friends of mine came over and they looked at my work and they said, wow, you know, your work doesn't stink. And I said, you're my best friends. I'm in a wheelchair. You're not going to tell me my work stinks. So get over it. Thanks very much. Have a nice day. Oh, and by the way, come paint with me and, you know, let's, you know, let's have a glass. More friends came over and they said, it doesn't stink. I'm like, I, I'm not going to believe you, but thank you very much. And then they brought a curator over of a small art gallery in Norwalk, Connecticut. And I thought, great, nice young lady. She'll be here five minutes, 10 minutes. I'll offer a Diet Coke. She'll be in and out. Two hours later, she left. I was very fortunate. She said, I want you to, you know, to be the headline of um, my art gallery for um, uh, February and March, um, which was right before COVID. And so I worked feverishly for another couple of months and pumped out a whole bunch of things. Had a whole bunch of people to the opening and was terrific. And I was very fortunate. I sold a bunch of paintings. And then COVID hit, literally March 7th was when my show ended. And what you see behind me, as I'm pointing here, and um, at the beginning uh, in the video, I decided that I'm really just flinging paint. I'm copying the greats, um, Kandinsky and Jackson Pollock, literally taking wooden brushes into, into, into vats of, uh, of latex paint, getting it, scooping it and flinging it and just flinging it and just doing this and that and trying to use both hands and swirling it around my hands and making a complete mess and enjoying it, but still copying people. And so I thought I need to stop flinging paint and I need to start doing my own thing. And so I thought literally for about a week and what I ended up doing was I take latex paint and um, I put it in the brush and I put it on the, uh, the flat uh, canvas that I use. And then what I do is I put paint, excuse me, in squirt bottles. I know it's very random. So I put it in the squirt bottle, I put it like that and I grab it and I just, I do my designs. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. That's another way to do it because it was really, it's tiresome for me to do painting with a brush. I can do it for about a half an hour and then I just, I lose all energy because I don't have triceps. I'm C7 incomplete also, I'm sorry, C6 complete. So nothing from the arms down and C7 incomplete. So halfway right here, um, para, um, no feeling, feeling. So it's literally right down the middle. Um, and so I thought, all right, I can't really paint that much with the brush, that's a bummer. What am I gonna do? And so I, I brought that out and I realized that that was, was a very cool thing. And so I thought, okay, well, what do I like? Painters, you know, they always say, Alder, you know, you should mine the depths of despair and the fear and the anger that you had after the, uh, the, the accident. You should take all of that darkness in your life and you should channel it into being, you know, into your paintings. And I thought, are you out of your mind? I lived that horribly for a long, long time. The last thing I want to do is to spend my time reliving the agony and, and whatever you want to call it, the despair, all of that stuff, the, the, the everything, and, and, and channeling that into my art and then hanging it up on the wall and seeing it again. So it happened once, I channel it again, I paint it, and then I see it four times. I don't think so. I think the only thing that I'm going to do is say, I can't believe that I'm still alive. I've got friends, I've got family. This is a good thing. Every day is a good day because 
listen, I'm 85% paralyzed. I have an aide who comes at eight o'clock in the morning, leaves at three in the afternoon. I've got one that comes at uh, 8.30 at night or nine at night to put me into bed. I'm in a Hoyer lift. It's like a crane, if you don't know. I can't do anything for myself, basically, but I can paint. And I figured if I'm going to paint, I'm going to be happy about it. So I literally take this squirt bottle and I take my favorite things, which are, <laughs> excuse me, symbology. I've always loved symbols. Don't know why, I just think they're very cool. Um, complex systems and symbols go together. Think of weather and then you look at, uh, you get the weather report and you see, you know, for lightning, you see sort of the jagged lightning bolt and then you see the clouds. Well, those are symbols, right? And they represent, graphically represent something that the reader or the person is trying to tell you or show you or have you understand visually. Well, I thought, all right, I'm in a visual medium. Why don't I take some symbols? And I started taking symbols and I've always loved archeology span also, completely filled with symbols and ancient languages and alphabets. And I sort of churned all that together and I combined it with, and I know this is a long and drawn out again, um, chaos theory. Chaos theory in the most simplest forms because it's very complex and I'm not gonna get it 100% right, but it's basically, Everything comes together for a reason. And it may look like it's completely disassociated or disparate elements. And you're like, how the heck do these things come together? But they all come together and they work perfectly to create an, an, an independent specific event. So when there is a hurricane and there was a hurricane, um, uh, uh, Henry or Henri that came by Connecticut, uh, what was it about a month or so ago? And it was supposed to come right up Long Island so here's Long Island, Connecticut's up here, it's supposed to come right up there and hit Fairfield where I live, smack dab in the middle. Well, what happened was it veered off just a little bit because there was a low pressure here and a high there and a something there and the ocean was whatever. Well, that's chaos theory. All those things came to be together and it veered off at the last moment and missed us. That's chaos theory working at its best. Now, if you were to take out as an example, one of the low pressures or whatever, it probably would have come and smacked directly into Fairfield. So chaos theory works in both ways, either when it's supposed to happen or not supposed to happen. And I thought, all right, so with symbols and archeology span and art, how can I put all that together? And so what you'll see here, I'm sorry, it's not so clear or there is a lot of really dense sort of art that goes together. But when you look at it, it all makes sense when it goes together. It's a really, I, mean, I didn't know what I was doing literally for the first month. I was just putting stuff down on, uh, on canvas. And I thought, wow, this stuff is kind of interesting. It, it actually works. I don't know if it works for everybody. I think it's kind of fun. And so I wake up every morning thinking, I have another one to do. And so it's terrific. And that's what I'm very fortunate about is that every day is a challenge. Every day literally is two more. Every day is literally for now. Some days I don't feel like painting and I realize that, oh my God, am I losing my compulsion and I realize it's just for now and then an hour later or then generally the next day later after I read a book or something boom I'm back into it and I'm pumping out art left and right I'm fortunate that I might have a, a I had a, show, a couple of shows this summer I might have a show in uh, Las Vegas <laughs> excuse me in October November I'm hoping to start maybe a clothing line where I put my my art actually on clothing a lot of random things that are happening because because why not, right? I think I've almost been able to do more in my wheelchair, in my paralyzed condition, after my traumatic brain injury than I was beforehand. I was going through life doing things and I thought I was making an impact, family, friends and all that. It was terrific and looking forward to retirement and all that, but I don't like to fail. And I figure if I'm in my chair, well, you know, people say, there's a reason you're in your chair, you're gonna change people's lives, or there's no reason, or there is a God, there's no God. Everybody has their own way about that. All I know is that for me, if I'm gonna be in this chair, I'm not gonna sit in front of a TV. I'm gonna go outside and I'm gonna do something, or I'm gonna stay inside and I'm gonna do something because otherwise it would be a waste of my life. I don't, I'm almost, I'm 58 now. I probably got another 20, 25 years. Well, you know, they say, you know, how do you eat an apple one bite at a time? Well, I'm trying to take two or three bites a day at least because it's better than not. And that's kind of where I'm at uh, these days. I'm very fortunate that Kessler is in my life. 
I speak to them, you know, on and off about research. I've taken uh, a range of different um, uh, uh, tests with them. I haven't gone on any clinical trials, never quite been ready for them. Uh, but the future is, is, is available and it's awesome because they're going to keep coming back to me as are other places um, if it's appropriate. And so I think that might be it. I, uh, I hope that was a good enough story. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I would love to take them. Uh, I think that's about it. Thank you so much. How much do you think the support of your family um, and your friends played into your motivation and um, your success? Uh, I would say only a small amount. The reason I say that is because the motivation came internally. Um, they were great to have around as support, but if I, 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 I don't paint for them, mm -hmm. I paint for myself. Um, having them around um, and be supportive, honestly, you know, I was supposed to not supportive um, or indifferent uh, definitely benefited me, but that's not why I ended up painting. And everything that I do, I do for myself or from within. Mm -hmm. So it's all about the challenge. It's all about two more or, you know, having to do it again and, and, and just, you know, I, I hate to fail, right? So if I, if I made a painting and I looked at it, I'm like, that's garbage. Well, then I'd paint over it or I'd mm -hmm. do something again. Um, sometimes I found that family was, and friends were just like, oh, everything that you do is great. And I thought, no, 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 no. I need some, some harsh criticism. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get better. And so I was, am still my own worst critic or harshest critic. Um, but it's a great question. I just, I didn't want to rely on anybody else because I thought, well, you can't necessarily rely on people over a long period of time they're great at certain intervals but then they kind of for me they flatline at after a certain period of time well that's where I had to step it up yeah so you've had I mean your internal motivation um and your ability to your gumption wasn't a it seems as though it wasn't it wasn't diminished by your accident your accident it seems as though it was actually um, encouraged or, or pushed further. And the fact that you have the, the compulsion um, to paint, it, it's, it's, it's enviable to someone who, m one of my difficulties is, is starting projects and staying on task is horrible because I'm so distractible, but um, it's nice to too. see. That, yeah, it's nice to see that you've been able to kind of push yourself inwardly with the things that you've said. And I, I, I hope that they work for me. I'm going to try them because I, I don't have that internal push anymore. I remember I used to wake up in the morning and be able to say, OK, today's a great day. Let me see. Do I feel like going to the zoo or do something? And now I wake up in the morning since my most recent brain injury and it's blank. It's <laughs> blank so I, I hope to use what you've what you've done to be able to maybe give me a kick in the ass so thank you absolutely absolutely and and i and and i i say this with 100 percent heart i'm happy to talk to you if you ever find that you're just in one of those moods and you want to talk to somebody to maybe pump you up and say hey you know let's paint together on zoom or you know let's do something uh, I would be happy to um, to hang out with you, you know, virtually you. or whatever it is. It's it's tough, you know. I mean, I wake up and I'm like, I mean, I, I won't spill all my beans, but my wife three months ago said, you know what? Two months, three months ago said, you know what? This is too much. I can't deal with this anymore. I'm going to divorce you. And I was like, wait, what? And so all of my creativity just flew out the door that day. And mm -hmm. then about two days later. I said, I, I, I can't not do anything, right? Okay, she's going to divorce me. I thought, I thought we were forever. And obviously nothing's forever, which is why when I said at the very end of, of, of the conversation, um, nobody's there for you except for yourself, yeah. ultimately. And so for me, I think, well, all right, do I want to be over here or do I want to be over there? And sometimes I just want to chill out and read a book. But I kick myself when I say, no, I've just, 
I've got to get out of bed. And this, this goes back to what that, that terrific therapist said to me, what you're feeling is for now, just for now, in a little while it will change and you will feel completely different. And so I push myself, if I may, if there's one more thing, if I may say, and this is actually what, what keeps me going every day is I call it getting my whoopee cat on long story about that. I won't bore you with, but from a Led Zeppelin song and what have you, but what, what, what getting my whoopee cat on every day, it's a state of mind that I try to get myself in. And the state of mind that I try to get myself in is how I feel when I'm dancing while nobody's watching. Now it's very, people are like, oh yeah, dance while nobody's watching. If you think about it a little bit deeper, what do you feel like when you're dancing when nobody's watching? What you feel is your most confident self. You feel like you're in a joyful, joyous mood. You have the armor on that basically says, forget the rest of the world. I am my best person right, Matt, right now. No matter what I'm doing, I am my best person. I'm in that mode where I'm listening to music, whatever it might be. For me, it's Led Zeppelin um, and a couple of other random things, some electro swing. And I listen to it and I just get into that mood and I realize, yeah, God, I'm, I love this and I'm in a great place. And then I try to bottle that. Mm. And so I remember that I go, okay, I feel that I'm good. Everything is good, no matter what's going on. Cause I'm jiving in my music and I'm just, I'm hanging out and I'm in a great place before I know it, wherever else I was, I'm not there. That was a, for now, I'm now in the, I can handle anything. Mm. I can handle the divorce. I can handle not being creative. I can handle when my aid is late by an hour and I'm, I'm stuck in bed because I can't get up and I'm just there gone. I'm beholden unto her. What do I do when she's late? What do I do when it's snowing? Mm. I, I listen to the music. I have an Alexa. I tell her to turn on, play a certain amount of music and I get to that place. And I know mm. I apologize. Well, I apologize, but that was a very long sort of dis description and discussion, but that's how I maintain my motivation to always try to do one more, to do two more, to get out there. And maybe mm -hmm. I hope that that might help you a little bit. Well, I'm sure it will. It was a little random, I'm sorry. I went sort no, of no, that's off. okay. I thought somebody was trying to raise their hands because I wanted to, so I'm a nurse. And one of the things that I've used to teach my patients was um, for them to calm themselves, especially like if they're going into an MRI machine or something that's causing anxiety, I would have them, and you can, anybody can do it. And now I have to take my own advice. Imagine the calmest, happiest, sweetest, most relaxed moment or place that you have and go there, just close your eyes and go there. And then create a, a, a combination of emotion, whether it's like Carol Burnett pulling your earlobe or just yeah. rubbing your fingers together and doing that over and over again you actually create the association so that in moments of real crisis, when you're having a panic attack or an anxiety attack, you don't need to mentally go to that place. It's like Pavlov's dogs that drool, just moving the motion with your hand and you automatically calm down. So, so even thank you for your, for your secondary comment, because now I have to take my own advice and I can do that too. So I, I think I've got to attach it to feeling motivated. So in moments when I do feel motivated, or I feel happy or encouraged, then that's when I should be attaching a, 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 a tactile sensation to it so that I can actually go there when I wake up in the morning and there's a blank. So thank you again. Terrific, that's a great idea. Thank you for sharing that with me. Mm -hmm. Alter, we have a question in the chat from Sharon. It says, um, art therapy, how do we expand it within the community? Oh, geez, that's a great idea. I. Um... Okay, you know, I feel the community of uh, rehabilitation or the community of, say, the local township. Um, it doesn't specify in the question, so I don't know. Let, if you let, let, let me double up on that. Mm -hmm. So in the, the, the community of rehab, I think having these conversations, okay, to the community. Okay, um, uh, thank you, Sharon. Um, you know, I think uh, schools, are a great place to, to, to start art therapy. I've been fortunate enough to, to speak in front of a couple of middle schools and talk to them about you know, my accident and about you know, art therapy and what it did for me. And you know, I think everybody, 
everybody should take art. I, I, I took it in third and fourth grade. I think it's probably, in my opinion, better to take it in sixth and seventh or eighth grade because your brain is more formed and you have better things that you might want to actually be able to paint or emotions that you want to get out there. But I think, you know, there are community centers that I'm going to be speaking with in the next couple of months that are art related, senior centers and community centers, um, activity centers, if you will. Um, and it's just a matter of, uh, you know, letting them know um, or showing them, um, making an example of somebody saying, listen, art therapy helped this person. I think if you were able to bring art therapy here, that person might, you know, or your, your community would be helped as well. I don't know if that helps um, answer your question, Sharon, but um, I also think, you know, from the, 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 the rehabilitation standpoint, I wish Chris had come to me weeks before that. And I um, was also a patient at Gaylord um, Specialty Hospital up in Connecticut mm -hmm. for my rehab when I came back, um, you know, uh, um, uh, outpatient. And they don't really have an art therapy group there. They have a little bit, but they don't. And I've been pushing for the last two years for them to really bring that as a, a, a um, oh, course, if you will, or a program, because you never know when you're going to find somebody like me who all of a sudden wakes up out of a, out of a TBI and has the ability to paint. Well, if, if nobody put a piano in front of me, nobody put math in front of me and nobody put art in front of me until Chris did. There's, there was another question in the chat from Allison. Were you always a motivated person or has it increased since your injury? Uh, great question, Allison. Uh, it increased since the injury. And I mean, I was motivated before I, you know, as much as the next person. I uh, didn't like to fail then, but now I hate to fail. And the reason I hate to fail is because I didn't die. And I think about that all the time. And sometimes, you know, I think we all think about suicide. We're like, oh my God, what the hell? How did I get into this situation? What's going on? And the answer is you're alive. So you're alive. So let's do something with it. And I, at the beginning, I thought, I'm going to chill out and watch TV. And I thought, no, I can't do that. And so I had to push myself because um, I was being challenged by the, the people at the ICU. All right, need to breathe for 30, for 10 seconds. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, nine, 10, 11, 12, just because. All right, we're going to do this three times. Then we're going to do it five times. And I thought the more that I did it, the better that I would heal. And I'm still teaching myself three and a half years later of things to do. I mean, I was making a joke this morning with, with Jeannie and, um, uh, and Angela and Shelby that I'm still learning things about, all right, if I want this and I want that over there, well, I have to go and do this and then pull that and then get that and use my teeth. Ta -da! I've just taught myself something completely different. And when that happens, I'm like, score. Today, I've done one thing that's positive that I couldn't or didn't do yesterday. And that's what keeps me keeps the drive alive is that every day I try to do one thing that I didn't do the day before. Even if it's literally stabbing four um, pieces of corn or, or peas with my fork. I did it, but I didn't do it yesterday. Yeah, small victories are, small victories are actually what would keep the drive alive for me. You know, painting is great, but I mean, if I don't drop a glass, or a cocktail or a wine glass or, or my, my juice. And I, because I don't have use of my fingers, right? I'm, I'm clutching it. And, or if I don't, you know, you see me tipping here and there. Well, I'm tipping, but I'm not dropping. A year ago, I was tipping and dropping. So every day I just try one thing, even if it's teeny, because it just makes me say I'm still alive and, uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna beat this. I hope that helped. Anyone else have any questions or thoughts they'd like to ask Alder? Allison stated that she works at a group home facility with people with TBI and would be and is asking Alder if he's interested in possibly setting up a Zoom art class with them at some time in the future. Terrific. Absolutely, Allison. I would be very happy to do that. I see you in the upper corner of my screen. You've got your uh, your green and, uh, and yellow and very colorful mask on. And uh, I would love to. That would be terrific. So I'm, I'm with a group of clients, so we're wearing masks right now. Sure, so, sure, absolutely. Uh, but no, yeah, I, I would be happy to do what I can. 
I will send you um, an email. I, I heard you say your email before, so I'll shoot you off an email and we can make a, a schedule for that. That'd be awesome. Terrific, Allison. Thank you so much. And, you know, whatever I can do to help. The, the, the person just asked a question. I'm sorry, uh, it's not Allison because I'm looking at Allison, but the person before that, you know, things every day, it's things that Allison just asked about that make me think, okay, if I can help one person, then it's worth whatever is going on that I'm helping that person. That's just kind of how, how it rolls for me. I hope that helps. Rachel had a, a comment in the chat. She said, uh, Alder, I totally agree with the sound of music. I think it's very important to select a song or music that gets you up and go. Very true. And when I'm painting, I'm listening to all kinds of music. I listen to Pandora or whatever it is, and I have the music really loud, and it's great. I don't have synesthesia, which is when you see colors, you hear music, or when you hear music, you see colors. I mostly when you see colors, you when you hear music, you see colors. I have a little bit on the other side of that, which is when I um, see things, I I I can hear music. Um, so it's a bit on the on the other side. But my, my life is filled with music. And it was, I liked music before. I mean, as much as the next guy, a couple of concerts here and there. Music now fills my life because it changes my mood. It makes me joyful. And I, it's really cool because now I paint. And so I see something and I'm like, oh, that music, God, I haven't listened to Joe Jackson in 30 years, or I haven't listened to Miles Davis or you know Kanye in a couple of weeks or whatever it is. I'm like, oh, I have to get that. I'll listen to that and then I'll start painting. So it's, it works for me on a lot of levels. Simply put, your presentation today was awesome. Your energy is unbelievable. Your accomplishments are just so inspiring. And I, I'm just so glad that Kessler asked you to present to us because we need to hear from you. We needed to hear from you. We needed to experience your energy and we needed to see your accomplishments. Job well done, keep it up. And I'd like to see and hear more. I, uh, <laughs> I took a course at the um, Newark Museum for senior citizens on collage. Hmm. And they, they had an art reception and hung our art in the museum for four hours during the, during the um, reception. And I felt like Mrs. Picasso because right. my art was hanging in the museum. So I strongly recommend to everyone do something. And for me, I can't paint, draw or anything, but I was able to tear paper and glue it onto a canvas, not a canvas, onto a board. Absolutely. And, and we did self portraits and we made our hands and it was amazing. So art 100, God bless oh. you. You're so kind and I'm, I'm humbled by that. Honestly, by being here, but by hearing that, that's really amazing. But what you just said though, is critically important. It's about creativity, not necessarily about painting. It's about creativity. We all have it inside us. I didn't know I had it. I got the bunk on the head and now I have it, you know, times 10, but it's all there for us. Whether it's a paintbrush or honestly, if it's clay or glue and pieces of paper and collages, there are incredibly accomplished artists that all they do is collage. They take, you know, New York Times and they take the, this journal and they take that and, 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 and uh, what is it, People Magazine and they mush it all up into whatever it is. And all of a sudden it's something original and beautiful. I think we all have that inside us. I just happen to hit my head really hard to get it outside. But I think, as you just said, glue and paper, and it was really cool. I think we should all try it. Alder, this is Angela. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's ever been upstairs. Um, it's not the clinical part of Kessler, but the research part of Kessler. There is a collage there that's made out of mass transit cards from the New York City subway system. Very and good. they put them together to look like a painting of Henry H. Kessler, who obviously was the founder of Kessler Institute. So if That's anybody terrific. ever gets a chance to get up there to see it, it's really cool. That's awesome. Listen, if I, you know, I'm handicapped. 
There are a lot of other people that are on this call that are handicapped. A lot of other people just in general that are handicapped. We don't necessarily know what to do or where to go. It's about self-confidence for me, especially. It's about every day going, okay, I can do this. You know, I'm getting divorced. I've got this. I'm in a chair. I need a blah, blah, blah. Okay. But if I can be a little bit creative and I can make something, even if it stinks, but I've made it, that's a really cool thing that I didn't do yesterday. So I think when we all talk about creativity and just little baby steps, these are the things that life is made up about. Life is made up of like five second or half hour, or in the, our instance, because I'm talking a lot, an hour and a half long adventures. This has been a, an incredible adventure for me so far. And then there will be one after that. And there will be for all of us. But creativity, a terrific way to sort of keep the drive alive and the day going. Oh, there's another question yeah. in the chat. Uh, what are some of the struggles you deal with every day that aren't physical? That aren't physical? Well, um, I can't reach far enough. That's not physical because physical is I can't lift something in my mind, but I can't touch something. I can't get somewhere. Um, okay, maybe that's physical. If you're thinking about uh, merely emotional or, or intellectual, um, it's difficult to stay happy all the time. And um, you need to have a motivation from your injury, any lasting effects. Oh, uh, Allison, I'm not quite sure what you mean, Allison. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, that are not physical, any limitations. Um, I'm very fortunate that I'm that I'm um, gregarious. Um, so like that any gets any me over I'm, I'm sorry, like any memory issues or anything oh, cognitive you still struggle with. Yeah, I still do actually. Um, I take about every year or so um, 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 a memory test, and I try to do memory online tests, or even just you know when we were kids, you know you. I get a two and a two, okay, and a two and a two, and it's, uh, you know, basically the memory cards. I try to do that as often as possible. I try to read a lot, um, but that gets, it gets a little much to tell you the truth sometimes. So I try to do it in small spurts. But yeah, I do have some memory sensitivity, no memory issues yet though, because I try to keep as tight as possible. Hope that answered it. And yeah. Jeannie, I'm sorry, I've taken a long time. Do you have any, um, or did you notice in the beginning, did you have to build up endurance to be able to paint for longer periods of time? Did you have any just being drained or just even by thinking the way that you think being drained? Yes, I would, I I would imagine, do you, do you slot rest time in during the, during the days or do you just kind of stop when you're shot? Uh, both. Um, sometimes I don't know when to stop and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden I'm just, like I bend forward and I'm trying to lean about, you know, a foot or a foot and a half in. And I realize that my diminished lung capacity, all of a sudden I can't breathe. And I'm like, okay, okay. And then I lean back and I realize, okay, I think I just went a little bit too far. So what I try to do is I try to take um, every half an hour or 45 minutes or so, um, uh, I drink more, uh, more liquids. So uh, cranberry juice, iced tea, water, um, and then that kind of picks me up. I drink coffee a little bit that picks me up, but I don't really go for more than an hour at a time. At the beginning, I was trying to paint like this and I couldn't do that for more than maybe five minutes, not even. And then I realized I'm going to get more bang for my buck in time by actually taking the painting and leaning it or the canvas and leaning it on the table. So now I paint, like you may have seen in the video, I paint, you know, squirt bottle down, down like that. And I turn my painting 90 degrees to basically change the, the, the direction of my painting. But it took a long, it took longer than I had expected, but not really that long ultimately, because the joy of my first painting that I thought was any good, I was like, I need to do that again. And that kind of took away the, the tiredness. It became more of an excitement. Thank you, Alder, for 
a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I mean, I can echo so many of the people um, who spoke or who put their comments in the chat that your <clears throat> enthusiasm, your energy, your inspiration has really lifted us today. And I really thank you for that. And today going forward as well. So thank you so much. Not I also, much. thank you. I also wanna thank all of the attendees. This is our last um, uh, speaker in our series, but we are um, planning to do this on a more regular basis, maybe not mm -hmm. four in two weeks, but we are probably gonna be doing this more on a, a quarterly or um, three times a year basis. I've had people ask me to keep these going and that they've been very helpful and informative and crucial um, to uh, the brain injury community and the people who've been joining us. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you, everybody. We've had some um, people who've been here for all four speakers. I can't thank you enough for, um, for joining in to tell, tell people about it because um, we will definitely be doing it again in the future. Um, and, uh, and we thank you again. This Northern New Jersey Traumatic Brain Injury Speaker Series was supported by a grant from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. Grant number 90DPTB0003. Interested in joining a study? Go to KesslerFoundation.org forward slash join.